wigglers, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah. that Philip makes me mad. Yeah, he's wound you up, hasn't he? Welcome, listener. If you've tuned in before, you'll know all about Wiggly Wigglers and the Blakeman Farm. But if you're new, welcome hooray! anyway. Yeah. It's a taste of country life down on the farm, deepest Herefordshire. And I thought, Rich, you could tell the listener a little bit about the county. Highlights of the county? Yeah. Well, I guess we've got the Wye Valley, haven't we? One of the most spectacular rivers in the whole of the UK, in actual fact. Yeah. The River Wye. It kind of winds its way down from Plinlimon right down through to Chepstow. And we've got the Wye Valley A and B that goes down You've Monmouth. fished most of it, haven't you? Yeah, a lot of the Wye, yeah. I've fished most of the Wye, in actual fact, under radar and with full permission in some instances. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you meant radar dam. Yeah. But obviously you meant radar <laughs> yeah, as I in mean, whether in you were poaching. someone else's fishing rights. <laughs> <laughs> Naughty yeah, boy. Yeah. And what else have we got? We've got the Woolhope Dome, which is probably one of the most ecologically significant areas as an upland limestone environment in the whole of England, in actual fact, we've got in, in Herefordshire. Cider. Cider, we've got, we've got cider. cider. We've got black and white villages, which some of the, some of the yeah. very famous for. Some stunning little villages in Herefordshire. And the cattle. And our Hereford cattle, yeah, yeah, which you'll see all over the world. Because right? yeah. not only are they brilliant for beef, they're also incredibly aesthetically pleasing. And they've well, got a gentle nature. just a minute on that, Richard, because Philip and I, which was why he made me mad, or yeah. I'll say it was, because right. I can't really tell you why he's made me mad. <laughs> Philip and I had a big row on the way home from Monty's parents' evening on Wednesday night. And it was about <laughs> As you do. beef. Oh. And Monty gets saying, Mum, it's just a Charolais. Don't worry about it. But Philip has gone out and bought a Charolais bull. And I said, why haven't you bought a Hereford, a Hereford bull? With the yeah. curly cream, beautiful face yeah. and the gorgeous body and the yeah. deep chocolate, russety brown. They are stunning animals, oh, aren't they? Which match the soil, which look wonderful. <laughs> Why? Why, Phil? Didn't you buy one of those? What was the answer? Farmer the an- flipping Phil. <laughs> <laughs> the answer was that most, although not all, of our cows are Hereford cross and therefore we didn't want too much Hereford in the calf. And the reason we don't want too much Hereford in the calf is that particularly the Hereford heifers are very difficult to fatten and very difficult to sell. And so what we tend to do is to have a crossbred calf and we use a pure Charolais or Aberdeen Angus bull on a crossbred cow, the idea being that we get a good quality carcass that we can fatten effectively and if it's hung and butchered correctly, that gives the best beef. But they've got yeah. curly faces, cream. So has my Shirley got a curly face. But Hereford, if I'm looking for a good steak, I'll try and find a, a really nice piece of well-hung Hereford. It, I mean, a beautiful that, marbling. I mean, that's the fine, and that's true, of, stunning, true of the bull calves, the steers, yeah. will give you great meat, but that's only 50% of the calves. Right. So that from my point of view... I want to be able to produce the heifer calves that are marketable as well. Okay. And it produces great meat. You know, I'm not saying anything against Hereford meat, but from a business point of view, Herefords are difficult because the heifers are so difficult to deal with. Right. You mentioned that they're worldwide breed, which they are, but it is interesting that the areas in which they're most successful are the areas where food is not that plentiful. So across America and Australia, where it's dry and fairly arid, the Herefords Mm. and Hereford crosses do very well because they don't run to fat. If you put a Hereford heifer on lush grass... It just goes like a mole. Yeah, but we all know See, what amazing. your what your objection that. to fat is, isn't it? It's because um, the supermarket wants a very lean piece of beef with a piece of fat stuck on the outside. Whereas if you're going to produce a quality product, then why not go for a Hereford bull? That's a good point, but the point is that the correct amount of fat is somewhere in the middle. The supermarket demands it too lean. If they run to fat, they're too fatty. In the middle is the correct amount of fat. Well, I'm not convinced. Are you, Rich? I'm not convinced at all. I know exactly where Phil's coming from, but, again, we're in a situation where the farmer perhaps isn't making as much effort as he could. Your retort, young Philip? Well, it's difficult to know what you mean by that. Uh, You know, we could fatten Hereford steers, fine, but Hereford heifers, you know, if you starve them, that's fine. You end up with a little animal that produces reasonable meat. But, but we're not a... asking for pedigree Herefords, are we? We're but just if you get too about... much Hereford in the breeding, most of our cattle have a quarter Hereford in them, the ones that go to eat. But they haven't got cream furry faces and gorgeous Some of them have. rusty brown bodies. They have. They have attributes, all of their very own. 
as you well know. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Anyway, we went off on one now, then, didn't we? Because yeah, I'm supposed to be introducing the show, There's you see. There's a lot more mileage in that argument, I feel. Oh, right. So, what's on the show this week? First of all, I want to talk about last week's show. Podcast 23 was, in my humble opinion, a fabby, fabby, dabby one. And instigated by our intrepid <laughs> roving reporter, <laughs> Ricardo, yeah. with his interview with Claire Short. And it was only marred by his complete lack of interest in prices. <laughs> How could you possibly not know the price? Yeah, you know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know this podcast is essentially non-commercial, but when... An ex-cabinet member, an MP, yeah. asks you, how much is it, Richard? Yeah, perhaps I should pay more attention to the financial <laughs> detail of my, of my position. Maybe. Oh, well. Yeah. 600 grams of Bokashi, 390. 2 kilos, 1150, 25 kilos, bargain, 25 pound. Right. And we got so overexcited with last week's podcast, we missed out Monty's weekly fact on worms. Sorry, Monty. Yeah. This week, we've got loads and loads of comment to get through. And we've noticed that our iTunes reviews are all by men. What do you make of that, then? I wonder why that is. I can't see why it wouldn't be sort of even, really. Nor me. Male, male and female. But how do we get more listeners, dear listener? And I thought, dear listener, you must know, because you are a podcast listener. So how do we get this show out to more people? You lot don't know, do you? As you'd have told me. We're working on it, aren't we? We're trying. Mm. Word of mouth, get people interested. I think one of the things that's important is to encourage people who are not already on broadband that it is not a fearsome thing, that it is relatively easy to get your broadband connected because that is key to the whole podcast experience. But the point is, if you want to share our weekly podcast and tell your friends, the first thing you have to do is get them on broadband, and that's a struggle. Anyway, moving on. On this week's podcast, we've got Anne coming in to talk about Mother's Day. Yeah. And I think Pussy Willow. Pussy Willow, oh, yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. I want to tell you about Leaf, linking environment and farming. Farmer Phil's going to be talking about muck. Alison and I froze outside doing an interview on our little <coughs> recording device um, about Oxide Daisy. So we've got lots on the show, starting with the feedback on the supermarket row. First comment we've got on Supermarket Row comes from Neil Foley, pod chef. Heather, Wiggly Team and Dick, great show. Exactly the sort of show that people need. Interesting, coming on the heel of this recent Sunday Times article. And the Times article is all about people not only wanting to buy organic and eco-friendly products, but they also want it ethical and right on now. So there's a whole article by Jessica Brinton on the rise of the conscious consumer. That's a really interesting piece. Go to timesonline.co.uk. Um, but he goes on to say, he thinks that all of you made relevant points and created the ultimate picture about why you should shop local for taste, for provenance and for quality with a fair price being paid to the farmers. And then he says, we had to laugh when Phil, with his you can't change big market power speech, later proves you can Tesco's doesn't have you as regular customers. You buy your produce and meats locally. Cracking good stuff. Where I live, which is a typical rural America, we have a somewhat decent selection of produce in our supermarkets. Buyers are slowly being educated about quality, but it's still miles away. Any comments from those interesting opinions? I agree particularly with the idea that big supermarket activities are only going to be changed by the consumer, their customers, not by us as suppliers. That was my argument to start with and it continues to be. If the consumer decides not to shop at the supermarket and goes to the farm shop, great. Or if they want to go to the supermarket, tell them what they want Mm. and they'll get it. Okay, so we're going on to the next comment, which is from Anne Chanky. She's a listener to the podcast and she says, Hi team, this supermarket row has motivated me to air my views in writing. The reason is that your podcast simply did not go far enough. Both sides broadly agreed that at present the farmers are dictated to by the supermarkets and the consumers do not have much choice in what they buy. But no one really came up with any solutions. As a consumer, my idea would be to be able to buy produce, Herefordshire beef, Herefordshire apples, at my local supermarket, where I do the rest of my weekly shopping. 
With the best will in the world, I'm not likely to drive across the county to a variety of farm shops in order to source my own local produce. I don't have the time. Neither are veggie boxes a satisfactory solution, as you end up with a farmer choosing what you buy. I would, however, head straight to my local produce aisle if such a thing existed in my supermarket. Surely I can't be alone in my desire to support the local economy. The question, therefore, is how to put pressure on the supermarkets to provide this local produce with the labelling to enable consumers to identify it. 1. Should consumers be writing to their supermarkets? 2. Should farmers be joining together to market their local brand? 3. Should DEFRA commission a survey to evaluate the market for local produce? 4. Should legislation intervene? What do the panel of renegades think? One thing is for sure, it's not realistic to suggest that consumers vote with their feet. In most cases, there are no practical alternatives to shopping at a supermarket. We can't turn back the clocks. Hope this gives you food for thought. Excuse the pun. Um, well, put that in your pipe and smoke it, you two. Yeah, well, she's got some really good points. I mean, in actual fact, she's kind of agreeing with most of the stuff that we said. And it's nice that she's taken the time to write down a few thoughts and send them to us, you know, and she's <laughs> felt bashing enough to do it. I didn't sense that but, she yeah. completely agreed with you, Rich. No, well, I think she does, really. <laughs> <laughs> you will, Anne. But there's, there's, one, there's one point she makes about the fact that uh, she thinks that local produce should be, uh, you know, in specific supermarket aisles. So that's a good point, because then you can be drawn to it, then. You're able to source your local food in a supermarket. The difficulty with that, though, is that the supermarkets can still dictate to the suppliers what kind of prices they're going to pay for their products. Phil? I think she brought up some very good comments, and I think that at the very least, customers like Anne should go to the customer service desk at the supermarket and ask for the things that she wants that she can't find. A classic example, you go to the bacon counter and all you can find is Danish bacon. If you go to the customer service desk and say, have you got any British bacon... It must make a difference. I also do you do that, Phil? I have been known. Ah. But I, I, don't, I don't buy Danish bacon, that's for sure. But she made a couple of comments about legislation and DEFRA. I believe that under no circumstances should DEFRA be allowed near the supermarket row. And I think that legislation, you know, farming is over-legislated. I don't see legislating against the supermarkets as very constructive. And in reference to the supermarket dictating prices to the farmer, the farmer doesn't have to grow or produce for the supermarket. That is a business transaction. The farmer doesn't have to sign the contract if he doesn't want to. We had Penelope Bossom over from Overbury Estate and they produced their own lamb and their own pheasant right. on the estate. She actually inspired me now always to ask where my meat's from in the restaurant right. because she doesn't eat it unless the restaurant owner can actually tell you where it was farmed and I think that's a really easy good way of starting to think about where your meat's coming from because it's so easy and when we went into the left bank in Hereford the other day I asked them where the meat was from and they went and found out. And it was great because in that instance they were able to say the butcher that they got it from and because we knew the butcher we knew more or less where he'd got it from. So that it doesn't have to be a complete answer. And the fact that people are thinking about it and the fact that Anne has moved enough to write to us suggests that she'll be moved enough to ask the question if she goes to the restaurant or the supermarket or whatever. Yeah. The thought is going in the right direction. There's yeah. no quick fix. And, you know, she's right. We lead, lead busy lives. You can't <coughs> trace around the country. Don't you think there would be advantageous if a farm shop was able to provide product online as well? Because with Tesco's, if you want to shop whenever you like, you can because they'll deliver it the next day. Whereas to go to a farm shop means, well, first of all, you have to remember the opening hours. I definitely think there's scope for that, but it is reliant on one thing, that the customer has to have the confidence in the product to be able to order it online. At the moment, you do know what you're going to get from a supermarket so that you order it online. To make the step to a farm shop doing the same, there has to be a building of confidence. I think it's perfectly possible and I think it'll come. And I think it's probably important that it does and that's the way to compete. Now, I said I wanted to tell you about LEAF, Linking Environment and Farming. We have mentioned this organisation before. I think they should be called LEAF App, which is Linking Environment and Farming and People, because they seem to be very good at doing all those things. But anyway, first of all, Rich is going to read out Roly Poozie's review of the Wiggly podcast. Should I explain who Roly Poozie is? Farms Liaison Manager. 
for Leaf. A few kind words from Rowley. He said here, Rating, five and a half star. Rick Stein, Jimmy's Farm, Bill Oddie wrapped into one. Fantastic. Hats off to the team at Blakemere Farm and Wiggly Wigglers for their podcasts that cover a range of countryside and healthy living issues in a fun, lively, topical and educational way. The team, Heather and Rich, paint wonderful pictures with words in such a personal and real manner, whilst Farmer Phil is doing a great job of representing thousands of farmers at a time when knowledge is low and interest in food, farming and countryside is high. Phil managed to unravel the politics, acronyms and realities of farming in such a realistic yet positive way. Well, there you are, Phil. <laughs> I mean, no one's ever said anything that's so nice about you, have they? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've said a lot of things about me, Rich, but you couldn't argue that I'm not yeah. an optimist. Absolutely, eh? you are a perpetual optimist. Oh, and oh yes, the hedgerow row. Rotational cutting is not just an organic thing, you know. It's a practice that's widely adopted by the majority of conventional animal-loving, food-producing, wildlife-enhancing farmers who recognise there is a balance to be had between food production and environmental management. Well done. Keep them coming. And as a last little note, he said, Heather... Seeing is seeing is believing and all that. You could also give all the farmers who are keen to host visits a plug. Folk can ring the Leaf office to arrange a visit. That's because there's lots of farmers all over the countryside that have been on the Leaf Speak Out course. And they have opened up their farms to visitors like we have this week. So if you've got a group of people who fancy going and looking at a real farm, I don't mean play-acting, children's farm, I mean proper job, then the first stop is LEAF. So it's www.leafuk.org. Right. And they've got a list of farms that are involved in the whole LEAF campaign of linking environment and farming. But also on that website, it's packed full of cracking information. I reckon LEAF are just this sort of nugget in amongst all these other initials. But leaf, they not only help the producer, but they also help the consumer. So you can actually go into Waitrose, see a leaf mark on a piece of meat or produce, and you can trace through who actually grew it. Right, right. Why are you laughing at me? Because <laughs> I, I was just thinking as I, as I read that, I've, I've realised that we've had a review from a person that really knows what he's talking about, and he's leaning towards my side of the hedgerow. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how long it would take you to come up with that. Uh, uh, well, actually, yeah. Rich, no, we can go back to that, because <laughs> what is rotational cutting farm? What he bill? means by that is that you cut, say, a third of the farm's hedges each year. Ah. So, so that, that, that's right. what he's getting at right. with that. So it's not the type of cutting machine? No, he would advocate using a flail hedge trimmer just the same as we would use. Right. But what he means by rotational cutting is instead of cutting the whole farm once every three years, you cut a third of it every year, but a different third. And that's something that you were leaning towards anyway, wasn't it? Didn't you think no. you thinking no. about doing something like that? No. If I was made to, that's the way I would do it, because that does make sense. But given the choice, I would still cut every year at the correct time, one year growth let the hedges get bigger. Far be it for me to bring the well, we massive wooden spoon, <laughs> <laughs> wooden spoon into the argument, yeah, yeah, and I can tell, yes. Rich, that you'd like Do to you shut way. me up. Uh, but just this morning, just for the listeners' information, Richard has explained to me how he'd been to see a property developer with a view to trying to ensure that new build thought about their gardens and making them wildlife friendly. And it was at this moment in time where he said that of course, he was explained to the chap in London how um, if you've got a chain link fence, you could actually run a native hedge down it. The guy said, but what about maintenance? And Richard pointed out to him that if you've got a large lap fence, you have to repaint it every year. Yeah. And if you've got a native hedge, you have to cut it every year. Yeah. Again, this is... This, <laughs> you see, oh, dear. You see, again, it, people think that all these things are high maintenance, don't they? You know, they automatically assume that if you have a bunch of life in your garden, then you've got to spend forever and a day maintaining it. Richard, stop waffling, mate, the, because the, the thing is... The reality is you don't. So on yeah. the farm, you must cut it once every three years, but in your that's, garden... That's low maintenance, isn't it? But in your garden once a year. It, what about that no, but the point. Uh, no, but the point I'm trying to make, that's the maximum that amount that you'd have to do it, you see. That's uh. the maximum amount you'd have to do it in the same way that you need to paint your large lap fence every year to preserve it. Farmer Phil. You keep digging, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've got anything to dig out of. <laughs> Let me put you in a hole uh, and we'll see. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Okay. Just before Anne comes in to chat to Richard about Mother's Day, there was just this little piece that I wanted to share with you. Uh, it's on the 6th of March. Marks and Spencers has a massive press release and advert telling you all about fair trade. I've got the paper here. It's about fair trade on coffee. They're working with their farmers to ensure that uh, there's a better standard of living, helping develop the local communities. Same goes on through the paper, massive page ads yeah. um, about cotton, Big helping expense. the cotton farmers. That's on the 6th of March. And on the 3rd of March, a right. tiny article in the business section of the paper yeah. that is basically this. Marks & Spencers has sent a letter to all its suppliers, farmers, food, textile, accessory manufacturers, saying that it will unilaterally knock 10% from their invoices and dock a further half percent for marketing expense. And the change takes effect on April the 1st. Good on them. That's just <laughs> terrible, isn't it? I just could not yeah. believe that, on the one hand, there was this fair trade for farmers in Africa. Politics, and yet, it? for local farmers, 10% has automatically been knocked off. The only thing is, it does say the change takes effect from April 1st, which is April Fool's Day. So maybe it's a joke, but I don't <laughs> think it is. No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. It's a real indication of how money works as well, because here we have a massive spread in the broadsheet about how they're you know, contributing to fair trade and supporting farmers from away. But the reality is that they have just screwed a whole load more farmers in this country to the ground with the, the amount of money that they're going to pay them for their produce. Anyway, dear listener, obviously we must let Marks and Spencers have their reply, so mm. you'll be pleased to know that I've actually emailed Stuart Rose, Chief Executive, to ask him about this issue. So whether or not I'll get a reply, I don't know, but he did give a wonderful talk to the Business in the Community dinner that I went to in London, because Marks and Spencers have got a big tick, and they're very forward-thinking in um, community and business, so I would love to know... Yeah. What, what this means. So yeah, absolutely. watch this space mm. and here comes Anne. Hi Anne, it's good oh, to see good. you. Thanks very much for coming in this week. That's okay. Uh, you wanted to come in and talk about a few things and there's one special occasion I think coming up that you wanted to talk about. Yes, that's Mother's Day. Right. It's only just over a week away. It is, it's fast approaching isn't it? What are you going to be doing for Mother's Day? Well this year I'm going to do daffodils which are one stem, which have lots of little daffodils, little, little heads on them. Oh, wow. They're predominantly yellow, but they have orangish coloured centres, most of them do anyway. Right. They're very pretty, and they smell nice too. Oh, fantastic. Well, is that unusual to get a nice smelling daffodil? It is. I mean, daffodils are usually just bog-standard daffodils, which don't yeah. smell at all, but these do smell nice. They're gorgeous. Right. So lovely to have in a room then, really, yeah, as a, as a bouquet. Are. Mm. And are you harvesting them locally then from your cutting patch? Not this year. No, they're no. coming from Cornwall. Right, OK. Yes. But obviously it's still very much English. Oh, yes. English growing yeah, flowers. Only English. Yeah. Yeah. Right, fantastic. Yeah. I suppose Cornwall, they've probably got more daffodils, haven't they? Because it'll be warmer down there than <laughs> it, must it be. is up here. That's right. Mm-hmm. Everything seems to be quite late this year, doesn't it? Well, the daffodils are only just coming out around here, aren't they? They are. I think it's certainly in previous years. I remember last February, you know, there were numerous daffodils, mm. weren't there? Mm. So we've had a proper winter, haven't we, this we year? Have. It's very cold. So what else are you going to put in your bouquets then for your special well, Mother's Day bouquets? I'm doing Pussy Willow. Right. Which is off the willow tree, the little, almost like rabbit tails. Right. Or up the branch, absolutely beautiful. My father-in-law helped me pick some last week. Right. We went up to our top fields and uh, my husband had found this pussy willow tree. Right. Told me all about it, so we went up with a ladder and I thought, usually willow breaks easily, but this one doesn't. You no, have to cut it no, with the cutters. Typical, yeah. Had to lob the branches off. No, of course, they're all too high. Right. And I'm not that tall. <laughs> <laughs> so we took the ladder and father-in-law was, said, oh, we'll put the ladder in here. Climbed up. He's coming up 80 this next month. Right, right. Climbed up the ladder, gets hold of the branch, says, will this one do? And I said, oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> and then he proceeds to swing from it. <laughs> <laughs> and he walks hand he walks his hands along the branch. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, oh <laughs> my god, <laughs> he's eighty, eighty years old. What's you're going to fall? Like, thank God, I've got the phone. Through the, through the I know. Yeah. And he said, well, you you grab the end now, and we can cut it. So anyway, 
<laughs> he survived. <laughs> Fair play to what's his name? David. David. No, yeah. Nice, nice, nice one, David. I know. <laughs> oh, that's that's brilliant. And and of course, the, one of the best things about pussy willow is it'll regrow, won't it? It will. You put it in water, and you'll see the roots come. Right. And then, of course, you can plant it in the garden or wherever you want to. Mm. So how amazing! People can buy a bouquet and then mm. grow their own, grow their own <laughs> yeah. tree. Yeah. That's amazing. And of course, they are really, really pretty, aren't they? Oh, they're they? beautiful. I think they're in decline. I think pussy willow are species in decline. You don't see them as much as you used to, do no, you? We used to have a lot of them, but right. we don't. We, this is the only tree we know of now. Right. So in actual fact, if people make an effort to root them and plant them out in their gardens, you know, they'll, yeah, they'll be, be helping the population. It yeah. would, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, so what, any other stuff in the bouquets? Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to have ivy. There's right. some ivy berries left still, which the birds haven't eaten. Right. And we've got silver birch. Right, right, which looks really pretty. Right, yeah, it's quite sure. sort of just a brown colour, but it's it's lovely, twiggy sort of wood and ivy, yep. of course. So the birch people assume silver birch are just kind of shiny white bark. That's right. Trees, but there, there's some lovely um, little catkins. detail, isn't there? That's right. And, catkins, and then the little buds come out. This beautiful green comes out of this brown stick. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Gorgeous. And then of course we have some dogwood as well. Right, lovely. Um, so a nice red in there. That's so right. lots of and a real assortment of colours. Then. Assortment of colours, yeah. And, and the lovely people, fragrance of the daffodil. So. If people want their bouquets, mm-hmm. when's the kind of last time that they need to order them by? Thursday. Right. Okay. But preferably before that. Yeah, because you'll Wednesday. be inundated won't you, on Thursday, yes. I imagine. Yeah, we've got quite a lot of orders already. So. Wow, brilliant. Yeah, busy on. Yeah, so you'll be looking forward to next week. Yes. You'll be up early. And of course, you're still lambing as well, aren't you? We so. are, yes. We've only got 40 something ewes left now, thank goodness. Only 40. Yeah. <laughs> and 30 cows left to calf. So. No, fair so play. So it's still two, two o'clock mornings. Busy girl, yeah. Never yeah. mind. No. <laughs> Brilliant. I probably just won't go to bed. I'll just stay up. <laughs> yeah. Do flowers all day. Yeah. All and enjoy and enjoy your Mother's Day yourself. What, what sort of are you expecting some bouquets for Mother's Day? Do you think from probably your children? Not. <laughs> I don't know. No idea. It remains no to idea. be seen. I don't suppose the flowers will be the last thing you want to see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably get my uh, normal run over daffodil. But... Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's lovely. All right. That's Thank you very much, Anne, for coming okay. in. Anyway, cheers. Right. Nice I'll see you soon. You. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Richard and Anne, and I must tell you that Rachel is busy trialling the ceramic beads to go in the vases of flowers. Uh-huh. Um, we've tried them in Monty's fish tank, and they keep the water clear, and word has it that they do the same. They keep your bacteria content down in your vase, so your flowers last longer, and Rach is trialling them. So watch this space, and over to Montague Goring. The Wiggly Wormcast podcast by Monty, a weekly fact on worms. Compost worms lay up to 900 eggs each per year. Thank you, Monty. Just a little bit of reply to Joe's tip last week on paprika for keeping squirrels away on your bird seed. And this is from Kate Pettern, who says, I haven't tried paprika, but cayenne pepper can keep squirrels away. You only need a little on seed still in their husks, about a dessert spoon per five pounds of seed, but loads more for huskless. Sadly, I learned this the hard way as squirrels ate through the plastic seed tube in my cage seed feeder. Hope it's fixed, Kate. Mm. And here is Alison outside. Well, Alison, it's really cold out here. It is, Hev. And yeah. whose idea was this? It was yours entirely. I've got my coat on I'm shivering and we're I- going to talk about some plants. <laughs> I thought it would be lovely to hear the bird song. Bird but song? The, the birds are f- <laughs> shivering in the haystacks, Hev. <laughs> it's really it's quite start, chilly. Just starting to snow Yeah, gently. and it's my home time. It's <laughs> five to five, so do hurry up. Oh, Cracker Jack. <laughs> Where have you been this week? Oh, I went to Cheltenham Races, Cheltenham Festival oh. this week. Very good, yes. I had a couple of winners and a couple of seconds, uh, so I was up on the money. Profit? Only, uh, well, only about £45 profit, so, you know, nothing to grumble at. But hey-ho, mm. had a good day. Drank nice meal Guinness. out. Yeah, meal out Guinness. afterwards, steak, you know. Last I done. heard, it was um, English three, Irish three in terms of races. Yeah, the Irish had a couple of winners yesterday, actually. 
and the Irish. You should hear the roars in the grandstand when an Irish horse wins. Really? My goodness, it is such an atmosphere. You've got to go to a chapman vessel for everybody. So, for all our Irish listeners, hello, dear Paddies. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they're great fun and they're real, real sociable people. I love them. Oh, anyway, <laughs> now we're walking over to the Oxide Daisy. Oh, yes, here it is. Pot that you've, you've got on our wiggly pot stand. So tell me all about this one, Al. Um, well, it flowers between June uh, to July. Um, it, it grows for two, two and a half foot. It gets but, um, flowers for longer than that, doesn't it? Well, right, you, get, you get a second flesh, probably. Right. The smaller ones coming up, yes. But you, are, you think they grow taller, don't you? Huh? I do, because yeah, in our yeah. Wiggly Meadow, as um, our listener will know, I'm an exceptionally tall person, five foot and a half an inch. Yes. And our oxide daisies, or moon daisies, grew to nearly my height. Ah. Really? I oh, know. Do you know what happened? You were kneeling down. <laughs> that's, <laughs> so that, that's the height of them, I'm afraid. But no, to tell you the truth, that all wildflowers, if they grow sort of in perfect conditions, in, straight into the soil, good compost, they will grow a lot taller than what you find in the wild. Really? Yes. They love um, it, do yeah, they? Yeah, they love it. And that the oxide daisy we've got on the farm, grown in a triple SI meadow, site of special scientific interest, and they won't grow taller than two, two and a half foot. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's put all me in natural. my place. Yes. It? Yeah. <laughs> and you said that they produce lots of seeds, which birds love. Yeah, they're about twenty-five thousand seeds per head. Wow. Yeah, and they all scatter out and self-seed all over banks and roadsides, and the chaffinches and goldfinches love the seeds. Yeah, I've so seen lots of oxide daisies on the edge of motorways. Yeah, they particularly like dry banks. Yeah, they grow particularly well there. Yeah. And I can imagine, I think they must scatter the seed themselves, not plant the plants. Or well, they suck, sow a few plants and then scatter the seed. I don't know, or they you know, sell seed readily, but yeah. Should we lovely. walk towards the warm? Yes, let's. Just as you finish telling me off right. what other so things they attract. So why sit in the warm before? Well, it's just that I've now frozen. Oh, right, so it doesn't matter about me. <laughs> with my short sleeve coat on. <laughs> I thought we'd head off in the kitchen and do the next okay. plant. Can we have a cup of tea? I think we can. Oh, excellent. Anything else about oxide daisies? Hoverflies love them, according to our garden at least. Hoverflies? Hmm. Um, all sorts of insects go on the oxide daisy. Um, because they, they've got so many... Oh, here's toast. So many seeds for flowerheads, so um, you know you get all sorts of things feeding off them, really. And how have you cultivated them at the farm? We have our own strips grown in the fields, 50 yeah. meters long, and we harvest our own seed because it's so easy to do. Yeah. Because you can get so many seeds, which most are viable anyway, and then it's treated from there. And then, do you polytunnel them in the winter, or are they always outside? They are polytunnels in the winter months, but usually we have to kick them out because they are flower too early. They grow quite vigorously in polytunnels, and you often find that we've got they've grown too big ah. um, to supply. So then we kick them out in the cold, and it it kicks them back a bit. Yeah, that, that plant was a healthy. Yeah, specimen. it was. They always remain healthy. The hmm. oxide daisy, like most wildflowers, they die back, as you know, and look pretty grossy. Mm. No, the oxide daisy always remains quite green. Now, you know how railways and trains always come up with excuses as to why the train is late, like leaves on the line? Yes. Now, I hear that there's some problem this week with the wildflower plants. Was there something oh. on the line? What was on the line? Rach said... <laughs> Rach, oh, no. Rach said... Alison says, we can't have all the plants this week because you can't tell what they are. Because... Well, they're under two foot of snow. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel said, why can't you bring these plants in? <laughs> because I can't find them. I have been digging, but they're in the snow. And she said, oh, really? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me like I was a complete idiot. <laughs> See, these temperamental suppliers. <laughs> yes, <That's>, awful <laughs> supplier. <laughs> Thank you, Al, so okay. much. Oh, off we go. We've got to go now. It's the end. Hey, hold on a minute. What about my muck? What? Well, it, my muck. Muck gate makes the garden grow. Good stuff, muck. Oh, we've forgotten his muck. Oh, dear. What can we do? What should we do? We'll just move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs>
Can you give us a quick resume or do you want to talk about it next week, love? Perhaps the best thing is we'll talk about it next week. Goodbye. I've got lots of it. Yeah, Phil talks dirty on next week's show. Bye Good for job. now. Bye.